Awesome. Uh, welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar on health and wellbeing in education. Um, and thank you for joining us. Before we get into um, the content of, of this afternoon, I would like to acknowledge that we're meeting on Aboriginal land and it always was, always will be Aboriginal land. I'm meeting on Ghana country. Um, our office is based um, in the city, in Adelaide CBD. Um, and so I do want to acknowledge elders past and present who still hold a deep connection to the land. And I think um, it's really important to continue to honour um, honor these really important protocols and, and, and honour the land that we get to work and live and learn on every day, um, particularly in a webinar like tonight's as well. Um, if you are joining us from another country, feel free to acknowledge where you're from um, in the chat. Um, I always like to hear if we've got people who are regional or people who maybe are from, you know, they're on Paramount or Naranjeri, um, please pop it in. Um, yeah, happy to happy to hear where you're from. Um, so Thank you so much for joining us for um, what I think is a really necessary conversation on health and wellbeing in education. Uh, I'm sure particularly those of you that are working as teachers or educators in the education sector, you'll know that this is an often neglected part of our work, of our core kind of pedagogy or practice. Um, but specifically at the moment, post-referendum uh, and and working through what the world looks like at the moment. I think we need to have really good, strong processes and, and understanding on how health and wellbeing impacts the children, students, young people, families, and their broader communities that we are working with every day. Um, poor wellbeing can impact children and students in like a number of ways. And when we consider some of the challenges facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, students and their families, um, these can often be linked to lack of understanding about mental health. So um, lack of, not their lack of understanding, but the lack of understanding of teachers and educators working with those students and children, um, and also um, understanding racism in schools and early learning services and how that can impact, you know, children, young people and their communities around them too. Uh, these kind of challenges can impact attendance at school, the way that children and students care or engage in education, and it also impacts their aspirations, um, which I think is a really important thing to talk about. Um, with the post-referendum result, we have seen um, a rise in incidents of racism in school communities and in early learning communities as well. Um, and so I think it's really pertinent that we talk about how we can support at least one small part of that, which is, um, you know, good, healthy and safe education spaces for children and for young people and also for staff that are working in those spaces as well. Um, some of you might be regular people who've attended our webinars a few times before, but today's structure, we're going to go a little bit different. We're not going to... Um, we're not going to be quite so formal and there's not a presentation component of, of this evening. Um, so we're just going to chat with our guests about, I guess, some um, strategies, some ideas, some, um, some research and knowledge that they may have in the space that they can contribute to the conversation to hopefully empower those of you that are in the room, either as teachers or educators, those working on the peripherals of education um, to understand the individual needs of children and students um, and also maybe some of the resources that exist out there as well and some of the people that exist out there that can support you with this work further. Um, I'm going to hand over to my guests to introduce themselves um, because I think it's really important that you hear from them and their amazing kind of background and understanding in this space. And then we'll get started into a bit of a, a conversation, some questions. And, and if you have a question, you can pop it in the chat. I'm trying to ask questions and run a webinar while looking at the chat box as well. So, but I'll try and get to them at some point. So um, yeah, if I hand over maybe to you first, Tamara, to do your intro. Sure, thank you. Um, so I guess I'll start off by saying who I am. So 
I'm Tamara Young. Uh, Young is my Irish last name from my father's side. Um, my Aboriginal family lines are with uh, Fernando and Flick from northern New South Wales. So I'm a Cory woman. Um, I grew up or I was born on Wiradjuri country in the Riverina in a small place called Leeton. Uh, and then I moved back to country um, when I was a little older and I grew up on country as a young person um, in Colorado, Bryan, Lightning Ridge and Walgett. Um, then as I got older, my parents separated and then moved um, all over the place. And so I ended up by happy accident in Sejuna. Um, so anyone that doesn't know, Sejuna is in the West Coast and is absolutely stunning, has some of the best water views um, and fishing in the state. And if you haven't gone there, I highly recommend. It's a beautiful place to visit and be. Um, so I went there for a year at Crossways Lutheran School so I could get a scholarship to come to Adelaide. Um, and in a lot of ways, Ghana country has saved my life. Um, as a young person, I struggled with mental health. Um, I struggled with racism. I struggled with feelings of not belonging as a fair-skinned Black person living on other people's country. Um, but also someone who carries a lot of intergenerational trauma from her own family lineage um, because half of my family, my Aboriginal side, um, it really embraced my cultural identity and I was growing up with my nana and my aunties and my uncles and my cousins and all of them who loved me and gave me lots of knowledge. Uh, and then I had my father's side that were very quite racist so um, I did definitely live in two worlds as a young person and as an adult, I continued that story. Um, so I went to Emmanuel College as a boarder. Um, I lived there until I graduated and then I, I stayed on Ghana country for a little while longer and I'm still here now today. Um, I've studied quite a lot. I've gone to the University of Adelaide um, and, you know, during my schooling years and also my professional educational years, I experienced racism in both spaces. So as a young person, but also as an adult in education. Um, so we, we definitely have more work to do, um, but that's why we're here today. So I'm really, really excited to be here and part of this conversation. Um, I've worked in government departments. So I've worked in the Department for Child Protection. I've worked in the Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisation sector. I've also worked in the not-for-profit sector around child safety in South Australia and Ghana country. And I'm very blessed to be part of this community um, and to call this country home. I'm very well connected uh, to people over here, to mob here. Um, and I also have my mother and my brother that live here with me too, and my fur babies and my fish um, and all of my other chosen family. Uh, so I'm a narrative therapist. I studied at Nunkwar and Yunti with Judith Lovegrove, Nick Leidig, and um, oh, my brain has just gone now. Oh, he's going to kill me. Anyways, I'll remember that later. Uh, Daniel Fijo, that's the one. Uh, so I was taught really well um, by some amazing Aboriginal leaders, um, and they're doing incredible things now still today. Um, and so I thought when I burnt out completely working in systems, what am I going to do? And that created Wonky Lines Counselling. So I've taken all of the knowledge of lived experience, all of the knowledge taught and passed to me through Nunkamore and Yunti's amazing RTO organisation um, and created a narrative therapy, also education service um, here on Ghana Country in Elizabeth North on Woodford Road next to the Red Lion pub if anyone's interested or knows the area. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'll shut up now because I know we've got lots more to talk about today and that's that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tamara. Um, and Kara Lee, do you want to do your intro as well? Thanks. Yeah, sure. I'm Kara Lee. I am the director at Connected. So we support um, education and care services to understand and implement trauma-informed practice. Uh, we also provide early intervention via our multi-D team, so supporting children who are developmentally vulnerable. Um, acknowledging that I am not an Aboriginal person here, so super grateful to have Tamara's lived experience and her generosity to share her experiences. 
Um, having said that, you know, we, we start every single meeting at Connected with an acknowledgement of country, which Nashley did beautifully. We also start with an acknowledgement of Wak Wakana, which is the Ghana word for children, um, acknowledging that children are at the forefront of everything that we do at Connected and are absolutely at the forefront of this discussion today. So thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Carolee. Um, so I guess like getting straight into it, um, just to make sure we're on the same page and that we have the same language and the same kind of um, understanding, shared understanding for this webinar, um, I wonder if you could both give me um, your kind of definition of what health and wellbeing means when we think about education and when we think about children and young people. And maybe I'll go to you again first, Tamara. Thank you. Um, health and wellbeing, it's such a broad uh, couple of words, so it's really hard to nail it down. Um, but I think in terms of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children or, or people in general, there's a huge amount of research that's been done. There's a huge amount of um, resources available to us. Um, and the social and emotional wellbeing wheel um, is a really great model of strengthening um, connection, uh, which helps us grow resilience and, and strong identity which we know resilience and identity and cultural connection and also connection to community and place create the ability to withstand um, higher amounts of stress that come from external um, sources of distress. So things like the referendum, for example. So if someone is quite connected to their community, they have people that they can call and lean on um, for helping to regulate their emotions for making sure they're not alone in that space, in that time. Uh, whereas if people are disconnected from their community, they may not have that, that larger amount of support. So that's just a small example of the social emotional wellbeing uh, model and how you can use it. If you wanna know more about it, Google it. Like it's, it's all over the internet. If you want it, you can find it and you can use it. Um, and it talks about um, key determinants of health and wellbeing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which are connection to country, connection to identity. Um, I think there's a part in there about connection to spirit, language. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but we could Google it, I guess, if you want to Google while we're having a yarn. Um, and then we can pop it in the chat or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, for me, I think health and well-being is such a big, broad thing but I, I tend to stick to the thing that's already there, which is the social emotional wellbeing model for Indigenous um, people. Thanks, Tamara. Yeah, and I will, I'll do a little search of that in a minute and chuck it in the chat because that sounds like a really great tool. Um, and I do, I think the, I'm sure you'll hear the word connection a bunch of times today because it is really important. Um, so, Carolee, what about you? How would you kind of define those two words? I agree with Tamara, a big, broad thing. <laughs> I think um, health and wellbeing, they're not mutually exclusive, but I think we often talk about them separately. I think when we talk about health, we often talk about physical health, you know, the absence of injury or the absence of illness. But um, whereas when we talk about well-being, I think it's more holistic. It's looking more at our um, our quality of life, essentially. So I think they're really interconnected. And I think to have um, good health can support us to have good well-being and vice versa. Um, but I think when we think about well-being within the education setting, it's about creating an environment where students, educators, teachers and support staff essentially feel safe and, and valued and, and supported. Awesome. And that is actually a really nice segue into the to a second question that I had, which was about, so if you do have, I guess, social and emotionally healthy um, schools where wellbeing is prioritised, what would that look like? And um, what would, I guess, the children, students and maybe the teaching workforce look like in that space as well? I'm happy to jump in with this one. Um, I think, look, it starts with physical health. I think sometimes that is 
the easiest place for us to start. And I think that's about, you know, promoting healthy eating habits or um, physical activity and an opportunity for children to rest their bodies as well. Um, I think it looks at emotional support. So um, offering access to counselling or, or something similar, um, access to sensory spaces as well for children to, to have that input that they need um, and implementing programs that support children to understand and, and do better um, emotional regulation. Um, I think it's about creating inclusive environments. So valuing diversity, promoting acceptance and truly committing to reconciliation. Um, but I also think we can't have um, schools that do promote health and wellbeing without truly um, understanding health and wellbeing for staff. I think acknowledging the truly important role that educators and teachers play, um, but also the challenging role <laughs> that, that, that it is. So I think supporting educators' wellbeing is paramount when we're um, expecting and supporting them to support children's emotional wellbeing. Yeah, no, I think that's really important and something that we often think about is you need a healthy workforce to, to help to bring up healthy children, right? Um, so, and I think it's it's important for me to acknowledge in this work as well that we have a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander educators, support workers, um, ACEOs, ACETOs, and then other roles within schools who are coming into to this world post-referendum, having to often be the supporter for the social and emotional needs of students and families while maybe not having that support for themselves as well. So um, I wonder, Tamara, if you've, if you've got any thoughts on that or anything to add as well. Yeah, it's something that I've really noticed as well post-referendum is there's uh, very little support being offered for educators and I know that being in education is already a really difficult job with time management and working out your schedule for the day, dealing with multiple children's um, little personalities. It's really hard to navigate and, and do all of the stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone looking after your own needs as a, as a teacher. Um, and then also getting additional education, you know, attending seminars like this. It's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. Um, and I think it would be really great if uh, education as a department really put more of a light on well-being for workers. Um, and this is just like my hope and dream for the future is that well-being is incorporated in into people's jobs just job descriptions as part of their like um, role. Uh, and I think we've got a, a question in the chat as well. Um, I'm curious of what support there is for elders too. And I've, I'm actually not aware of the support for elders in South Australia post-referendum. Is that something you could speak to, um, Nat? Do you know anything that's available? Yeah, look, when it comes to um, education sites, because they operate very independently um, and kind of it, it's up to them and their decision-making about whether they're engaging with elders or senior um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And our recommendation would be that they point them towards the same resources that they might be pointing their staff towards um, and supporting them to access the mental health and wellbeing resources that exist. If they're employed even if it is as like a casual contractor, being able to provide them access to things like their employee assistance programs. There are some um, Aboriginal owned um, EAP um, organisations that could be really useful. And if schools don't have access to those, I would consider getting access to those. Um, but it is very much dependent on, I guess, the individual school or early learning centres um priorities and what what they're offering so but my my suggestion or I would be pushing you to think about well have you if you've got an elder in residence say or you've got someone who's regularly working with your site whether that's quarterly or more often have you reached out to them um have you offered them any support have you checked in I think something that Tamara said early on in tonight was around that connection to community and connection to to people um, 
do the people that you're working with have those kind of structures around them? Um, have they been given the opportunity to debrief? Um, there's been some really amazing events where um, people have, have, you know, organised collection points where we can all spend some time together. There's been shared lunches, connection to country events. So there's probably ways in which you can support, um, you know, those people that are close to your centre or your school um, to engage. So I guess that would be my advice. It's not so much that there is a process, but if there if there isn't one, then I think make one um, and it's not too late. You can still really put in some good um, support mechanisms and think about that for the future because I know we're saying post-referendum, but um, and as we'll get into with some of the content for tonight, there are lots of um, triggers and challenges that can happen. And so what sorts of processes do you have in place to support the health and wellbeing of staff and to support the health and wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, elders, community members? There's lots of people that are working with education sites. Um, so just, I guess, don't, that's that transformative relationship, right, that we talk about with um, when we're building relationships um, as a school or as an early learning site, we talk about transformative, not transactional. And this is where you can really step up to the plate and not be a transactional relationship where you're checking in on people and you're, you know, repairing and and returning to that relationship and making sure that those people that you're working with are, are okay and are, you know, have, because a lot of people that we work with, they might not have access to services or they may not have the resources that you have available to them. So that was a really long way of answering that question, but it is something that I think is really important, like that we really think about those people that are connected to us. Um, <clears throat> we might be the only people that have thought about a particular, you know, service or or event or something to get them to. So thanks, Tamara. Um. So I think it is really important, I mean, always when we're looking at children and young people, but I also think at the moment um, and with other things like racism impacting schools and early learning sites um, or general, like the media coverage has been um, pretty gross um, and that impacts children and young people. Um, but I think it's important that as educators and teachers that we understand um, the behaviour of our students and that we maybe, um, you know, think about the fact that students and children may be experiencing things like rejection, racism, uh, disrespect for their own culture and their identity. Um, and why is it so important to understand behaviour and to think about the cause or reason for behaviour rather than making our own assumptions? Uh, who, Tamara, do you want to maybe start? I'll start. Okay, and <clears throat> I think Kira Lee would really throw in some really great juicy stuff for this part. Um, so when I talk to young people, so I do a lot of work with children, young people in child protection systems. So they might be on short-term, medium, medium-term or long-term um, guardianship orders of the minister here in South Australia. Um, and most of the children I interact with have what I call identity-based trauma. And this is a term that's frequently being used now um, when working with multicultural communities and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, because we have young people and children growing up in systems where they may not have access to their cultural knowledge. So like I said in my story at the beginning, I grew up in both a cultural family, an Aboriginal family that loved and embraced every part of who I am. And then the other part of my family that was quite racist um, and I would be treated differently in the home context by my grandparents. So my grandfather wasn't so um, poor with his behaviour, but my grandma, my grandmother was um, because she had identi identity-based trauma as well. So my grandmother actually comes from an Aboriginal mother but she denied her identity because growing up at that time, and we've got to think around the social political context of when our parents and grandparents were growing up, it was a very racist place to be living in the in the Riverina. Um, and it's all about country people and it's all about um, you know farming and 
land acquisition and building an empire and all of these things. And so she denied her identity really strongly. And because of her denial of identity, she would then treat me and my brother quite differently to the other grandchildren, not because she loved us any less, but because she didn't want to accept or embrace her own identity as an Aboriginal woman. And so it was always told that she is non-Aboriginal and we were always treated differently in the home. So when our children are living in those sorts of environments, which they are, our children have both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal or Aboriginal and other cultures. Um, we have very diverse communities now made up of, of a whole mix of beautiful uh, multicultural mixes. Um, we're dealing with more than just one identity. We're dealing with multiple cultural identities. And then we're also dealing with the identity of a country that is suffering from assimilation trauma. So the fact that Australia denies its own history, historical history, um, but also recent history, um, and we tell false stories around our truth as a nation, uh, and then we say to people that migrate here, by the way, you can only speak English, and if you want to learn another language, you can't learn your own, you have to learn German or Japanese or some other language that's taught as part of the curriculum. So I think there's a whole jumbled mess of things that get in the way um, and then create behaviours in children. So uh, like a, I think I'm going off on tangents, but a lot of my kids come to me and they definitely experience racism at school. I've had children and young people as young as uh, nine um, and as old as year 12 and a whole bunch of other horrible names. So this is current. This is 2023 and it's happening now. Um, and so this conversation has never been so important that our educators understand that when these labels are getting thrown at children and young people and then they start internalising labels as part of their identity, so going, oh, well, I am just a lazy black kid, um, I am going to become nothing, and I know you mentioned about the impact on our aspirations for our young people, so when they start believing these false stories and labels as part of their self-identity, it's really hard for them to act in a preferred way, in the true way. So they end up feeding into the fake story and becoming what they believe that they will become. And that's the, the power of the narrative is that we can rewrite our stories. Um, and if we look past our children's behaviours of acting out and we see that as uh, reaching out for help, then we can actually embrace our children and young people in an educational space and go, right, we've got some behaviours here that might be hitting or kicking or punching or spitting or calling names or whatever the behaviour might be. Go, right, let's look beneath the behaviour. We all know about the iceberg model. We all know about the water level and the tip of the iceberg and we see the behaviour at the top. Let's think about all of the undercurrents underneath the water, whether that child is part of intergenerational trauma, so stolen generation, first, second, third generation child. Um, there's only eight generations since invasion or colonisation, so it wasn't that long ago. My great-grandmother, so my mother's mother's mother, has a photo of her um, exclusion from the town. So this history is, is real and it's really present. So that's underneath the water. Also, is the family racist? Are they growing up in the two worlds at home as well? Um, what other stories are these young people hearing from the media, from the news, from TikTok, from Snapchat? Um, Snapchat's a big thing at the moment in terms of behaviours and bullying and racism. Um, but I think I'll, I'll stop there because I could talk all day. This is my problem. Um, but put simply, if we look past behaviour and try and be more curious to where the story is really going wrong for a young person, then we can best implement strategies to help support them in managing the behaviour, but also helping them find their real aspiration, you know, that they are not just a lazy black kid or they're not just a, a whatever they've been labelled as that they have abilities and capacity and um, they can and they will become whatever they choose to be. And I'll give you a hopeful example. So here's an example that isn't so sad. Um, one of the young girls I know grows up in care, comes from Tennant Creek, lives on Ghana country. 
So already there's a massive disconnect. She came to one of my groups. She saw my space here in the north and she's an amazing artist. And she says to me, Tamara, do you think you could sell my art for me until I have my own business? She was 11. So for me, that shows her seeing Aboriginal people in spaces that we never were in before, which is business, which is education, which is government, which is decision-making, which is management, which is whatever it is, inspires them to see that they can become something outside of the false narrative that they've been taught or that they might be hearing. So there's always hope. There's always light in the dark. That's my, I'll stop now. Kira Lee, what would you like to say? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. There's always hope. There's always light in the dark. Um, I would like to say trauma-informed practice is about looking at um, children holistically. And naturally, you know, anyone that's attended training with me knows that I talk a lot about the iceberg model that um, Tamara mentioned. So it's an, for anyone that doesn't know, it's an analogy for understanding children's behaviour or for understanding anyone's behaviour. Um, so above the surface, we have the observable behaviours that we see and below the surface, we have um, the things we don't see. So the reasons behind the children's behaviour, the feelings and the needs that sort of drive those behaviours. Um, and when we focus on those observable behaviours, we often come up with strategies to stop behaviour or to redirect behaviour. Um, and when we do that, we're missing huge opportunity to get to know that child and get to know what's going on behind the scenes and, and below that surface, just as Tamara was just talking about. So um, so instead of viewing the behaviour as inappropriate, like you mentioned, Nashley, we can really understand what might be happening for that child when we use the iceberg model. So when we think about children or Aboriginal children who might be experiencing rejection or racism or issues with identity as a result of the referendum, um, we can really, we can see their behaviour through a different lens. And that's what trauma-informed practice is all about. It's about viewing behaviour through a different lens. Thanks, Carolee. Yeah, and I think um, one of the things that I, it's a bit off script, but um, I think you might have some something to contribute here is um, that idea as well of like understanding often that behaviour is really about children and young people communicating something that they need um, and I wondered if you could maybe just add a little bit to that about like you know how as teachers and educators we can potentially instead of what you said of looking at behavior as something that we can stop or fix how can we um, reframe or rethink the way we look at children and young people to meet their, their needs and what those needs might be. Yeah, I think behaviour is communication. That's that's what we say all day, every single day at Connected. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> behaviour is communication. We know that um, when we truly understand children's behaviour, we're not looking at using rewards or punishment or any of those other sort of short-term, short-lived strategies to, to extinguish behaviour, to redirect behaviour. Um, we're really looking for the feelings and the needs behind behaviour. So children might be... Um, you know, exhibiting a need for communicate, uh, a need for connection, or a need for communication, or a need for um, you know, a sense of control. And when we view behaviour as that communication, we look to meet those needs, and and we really take a step back and look at the child holistically, and look at the different ways that we can meet those needs. Um, which means that we will have a, a lot more success moving forward working with that child and we will see a lot of those behaviours dissipate. Um, it's it's about, you know, viewing it, um, we use that whack-a-mole analogy, you know, if you try and put out a behaviour over here, it pops up as something else because we've left that feeling and that need unmet. Um, so when that child still needs what they need, that behaviour pops up looking at like something else and it pops up somewhere else looking like a different behaviour. Um, so we really um, support educators and teachers to understand the feelings and the needs that the children are trying to communicate so that we can support those children to, to have what they need. You're still muted. I think you're on mute, Nat. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, it's going to happen, you know. Just let that let that slide that one um yeah look I think it's really important to talk about um the needs of children and young people and and particularly I think as well to maybe just extend on some of that work is that in um, secondary schools particularly 
um, what we're seeing is often that children feel unheard. So like that need for communication, I think, um, when we're talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, um, we're looking at things like them trying to communicate to their teachers that they've experienced racism, that they don't feel like they're being heard, that they're being treated unfairly. And so thinking about, you know, how do we improve the systems and the structures as well that exist in those schools um, to be able to really hear and allow you know, those young people to participate. Because obviously this kind of, um, this trauma-informed practice and um, looking at behaviour as communication looks really different in early childhood than what it would look like in a high school. But it's really applicable across all the years. And honestly, you can apply this work to like adults in your life. If you're having a problem with like your dad or a family member, I suggest you think about this model as well. <laughs> but you know, looking at those like high school students and, and we see really like a lot of increased incidents of, of physical behaviour in the schoolyard and fighting and and how do we continue to, to practice this work with those older age groups to hear the voices of children and young people and hear what they're saying because some of the things that they're trying to communicate to you are nuanced and challenging and require you to think about your own identity and your own biases as well. Um, but it's incredibly important work um, and things that we really need to embed within our practice, I think, as teachers and educators. Um, I had a really big, big question here, but I'm going to um, reduce it a little bit. I think it's important just to um, go into trauma-informed practice a little bit more. Um, but I think in education settings, particularly in for, like the really formal education, like primary and secondary schools, um, trauma-informed practice is not always prioritised or, or valued um, as much as it should be. And I wonder um, what your thoughts are or what you think about the education system and, and educators and teachers working across all the education systems, so early childhood to secondary being trauma-informed and how that might be transformative or change the way that we view children and young people. Who would like to jump in? Tamara. She's on. I, I just want to do like a huge shout out to all the traumatised teachers in the place, like holla. Um, so we talk about trauma-informed practice and care for children and young people in education, but we have a whole um, department full of really educated, amazing educators uh, that are burning out and exhausted and overloaded and overwhelmed and under-resourced and underpaid. Um, so I think it's a really hard ask to have an additional line item added to a job description that is already really challenging. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of work in terms of education and how it's going to change over time. Um, I think there's huge ability to implement strategies for well-being for both teachers and students, um, but it sort of has to be respectfully, it has to acknowledge the trauma that the teachers have, have been going through as well. Um, so I just want to do a, a huge shout out to that. Um, and before we could even implement anything in an educational space, I think it's got to be addressed as well. Um, but that's just my opinion um, based on so many people that I've met along the way and stories I've heard. Um, what would you like to say to that, Kira Lee? A lot. <laughs> I would like to say a lot. No, I, I agree with you, Tamara. I think um, when we have people who are truly doing the best with what they can with what they have, I think um, we need to acknowledge that. Um, I also think, um, I, again, another thing we say at Connected all the time is um, trauma-informed approach is critical for some but beneficial for all. So it's not um, a special sort of practice that we reserve over here for this group of children. It's um, once we truly understand trauma and once we truly understand behaviour as communication, it changes, like Natalie said, it changes the way that we view children, it changes the way you view your husband, your friends, your family, your everyone. So it's it's not um, a hat that we put on in different roles. It's 
viewing children and viewing humans differently. And I truly believe that every education and care setting should be trauma-informed and every educator and teacher should have access to trauma-informed professional development um, because trauma is more widespread than unfortunately any of us would like to acknowledge. Um, I also think that it's really important to know that, you know, we don't always know children's uh, backgrounds. We don't always know um, everything that people have experienced, which is why we we don't have a trauma informed folder that we pull out when we think a child has experienced trauma. It is a way of doing, a way of being, a way of experiencing the world once we truly understand trauma informed practice. Thanks, Carolee. And yeah, I think you kind of jumped into another question I was going to ask, which means we can skip it. But um, it, it there is like really no harm in in participating in education and learning more about trauma-informed practice. And I mean, um, in the work that I've done previously in inclusion and working with children, I found that learning about trauma-informed practice and different ways in which that can be implemented only made me a better educator for all students because, yeah, sometimes it's trauma, but sometimes it's stress. Um, there's lots of different things that happen for children and young people and their families um, and you start to really promote communication and relationships um, which when we think about the work that we're doing around reconciliation it's really about building strong reciprocal and transformative relationships with the people around us um, and so how do we do that when we're we're you know choosing to um behavior manage or control um, what's going on around us instead of understanding and empathy and compassion so um, sorry can I jump back in on that yeah yeah please <laughs> it's about I guess um, creating safe and supportive environments and I don't know any child in the world that wouldn't benefit from that it's you know we at Connected talk about um using regulatory and relationship-based approach. And again, I, I don't know any environment that wouldn't benefit from that or any, any child that wouldn't benefit from that approach. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think um, I do really agree with Tamara as well, and I'm seeing in the chat too that um, this really, I mean, if you're looking truly at a holistic process, then it will include your educators and your teachers and the people that are working with children as well. And we have, we've only got like 15 minutes left of the webinar, so I won't go into too much detail, but we do know um, that the educators and those working with children, and particularly if we do talk about those children who have directly experienced trauma, um, you can have vicarious trauma. There are lots of ways in which educators and teachers are really deeply impacted. Um, and so, but good health and wellbeing practice will support every single person in your site and the better that you can get at those healthy and safe environments. But I think the, I guess the biggest problem that we have that we're not going to be able to solve in a one hour webinar is that there needs to also be thought considered to systemic approaches and how we can support our teaching workforce and our leadership in education systems as well to be um, healthy and to be focused on their resilience, their connection, their relationships, um, and all of those elements as well. Um, given that we only have 15 minutes left, I'm thinking that maybe I'll just jump to the last question, which is, um, you know, we, um, we didn't have much time today. We never can cover everything, but where can we send our teachers and educators to find out more information? So what info, resources, websites, training, um, where can we go to support our learning or to support, you know, those people that we're working alongside to get that health and wellbeing um, support information, professional learning? Maybe tomorrow if you want to pop in first. Thanks. Well, what do you want to know? Um, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of information, but it's about what do you really want to know and what's going to really help you in your role um, and your students. Um, there's not really a one size fits all. Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's heaps. What What does everyone want to know? Ask Ask a question, and I'll I'll give you a resource. <laughs> now you hear that? Put 
put some um, things in the chat if you have some questions um, or if you have some particular resources that maybe you're interested in finding more about. Um, and if any elders are struggling, um, I will help them for nothing. So if you've got elders, just send them to me and I'm happy to catch up with them and make sure they're okay. Um, there's a couple of elders groups in the city area. I don't know where everyone is, um, but nine times out of 10, I can find someone somewhere nearby that I can plug them into so that they're not alone, um, especially at this time. Yeah. Yeah, and connect with um, Reconciliation SA as well. So we know of some of those um, elders groups too, um, or we can reach out to, to Tamara or to other people that we're working alongside um, to find that information out for you as well. So um, I think in terms of resources or people that you can connect with, you've got two uh, women who have got their own amazing businesses um, so you've got Wonky Lines Counselling and you've got Connect Ed as places that you can definitely engage in conversation or in learning. Um, Carolee, how about you? Do you have any kind of places that you push educators towards for some of this initial learning? Yeah, I think in terms of, um, you know, reconciliation, developing a reconciliation action plan, you, <laughs> we, su we support them to access um, your support at Reconciliation SA. I think in terms of, um, you know, educator wellbeing, we often support educators and services to access the support of BU. And I can see that one of the consultants is online at the moment. Um, and absolutely, if there's anyone that wants support to better understand children's behaviour in terms of, you know, trauma-informed practice, we're more than happy to um, provide some support. There might even be some um, funding opportunities that you might be um, eligible for as well. So more than happy for um, education and care services to reach out to us. Absolutely. Thanks, Carolee. Yeah, so look, I think um, probably the best thing to do in terms of like finding out more information is to get on Google um, and look up some things. You can also send me an email um, and I'm happy to share any questions or any um, any queries that you might have um, with our guests um, and, and find out more information. Um, it is, as Tamara said, it is really tricky. If you have specific challenges, um, they require specific answers um, and specific resources. I, I do think it's important to, um, to maybe know uh, some of the helplines. So I think um, it's 13YARN is a really good one um, for if you are looking for like really um, immediate kind of support um, or some conversation um, as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, I think that that is a great hotline. I'm having a complete mental blank of um, the kind of the other regular hotlines. I don't know if anybody can think of them off the top of their head, Tamara or Carolee. I think I've got a whole bunch of them on my website on the inquiries Wait. page. So it's sort of like, you know, if it's if it's an emergency or if you need someone right now, here's mm -hmm. a whole bunch of numbers. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I do want to say um, before we do all go that if anyone's ever stuck and they don't know what to ask or how to ask it, I'm a phone call away or an email away. I will generally help you for free. I will not help you for free for more than five minutes. So if it's a quick little thing and you need somewhere to go and you need to be pointed in the right direction, I'll do it. Um, I didn't create a business to make millions of dollars. I created Wonky Lines Counselling so that there were answers for people that were looking for answers like that rather than waiting for a, a department or an organisation to get back to you after three weeks' time. So if you need something, call me. If I don't answer, leave a voice message. If I don't return your call, text me. If I don't text you back, email me. And worst case scenario, come down to the shop and bash my door in until I say hello. Um, I will get to you at some point. Um, but, yes, always open to have a yarn about anything and everything. Please don't ever feel scared or intimidated or nervous. We grow up in a family, in a society that teaches us how the world is. We live in a country that is very racist. That is okay because we can undo it. The best part of racism is it's a, it's a learnt behaviour.
so we can unlearn it. And we know that behaviours come from what, Kira Lee? Communication. Yeah. So if we have racist behaviours, we're trying to communicate something which might be feelings of inequity or unfairness or injustice um, or disconnection. So I always have hope that whenever I meet someone that has a racist behaviour, that they also have a big heart and a big family that loves them somewhere um, and I know that we can undo any of those learnt behaviours. So there is always hope in a world of disconnection because we're people and we can always reconnect. Thanks, Tamara. I think that's a nice um, point to maybe finish on. I just will say that Jane has put um, an email into the chat as well for any sites that are Department of Education. Um, there looks to be some, some trauma-informed um, practice that you can find um, online and you can email um, that email address as well. So definitely do that. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I just I really want to end on just a couple of notes. I think particularly um, because we are looking at, um, you know, in reconciliation work, we are looking at how um, predominantly a non-Aboriginal teaching workforce can implement some of these suggestions and, and consider the health and wellbeing of their students. And so I really wanted to go back particularly to some things that Tamara said in the beginning that I, I hope you really take on board and leave with. Um, and it was those ideas of, I guess, going back to that social emotional wheel, but particularly that often people are seeking a connection to community or place, um, a connection to their identity, to language, and to their spirit. And so when you think about those things, how do you um, implement culturally safe, healthy um, settings that, you know, promote the well-being of students, of children and of your families? And I think those are some good starting points to really consider. There is a culturally responsive teaching um, workforce um, on AITSL, the um, Australian uh, Professional Teaching Standards uh, website, and they have released a, um, a tool, a reflection tool. It is for teachers, but you can all do it. Um, all of these things can really support you to become, um, well, not to become, but to work towards being a culturally safe practitioner and working in ways that are psychologically safe. Um, in your site and that is really thinking about this work and thinking about things like intergenerational trauma. Um, I've also got some own research for myself to do today around identity-based trauma and assimilation trauma. The, that language has really stuck with me today and so um, I just really want to extend such a sincere thank you to Kara Lee and to Tamara for joining us um, for this afternoon's chat. Um, and look, an hour is just never enough to deep dive into all of this work, but I think it's so important that we remind people how I, how important well-being is and how, I mean, as we said at the beginning, it's such a huge, chunky thing to think about. Um, but really, you know, there are some ways in which even if it is just trying to understand our children, our families a little bit better, um, you're going to see the benefits as a result. So Tamara, Carolee, do you have anything final you want to say before we finish up? No, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be part of a conversation and see so many people so committed to supporting children in South Australia. So thank you for having us and thanks everyone for being a part of it. Thank you. And Tamara, I'm sure you're going to be inundated with emails after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> please, please, please be careful with me. Be kind to me. I'm not funded. I'm one human and I do a million things. So if you need me, that's great, but just wait. <laughs> um, and also uh, one thing before we go, um, I'll let you all know that you have a heart in your body. Uh, science is catching up with what we already know as human beings and they've measured that the heart releases electromagnetic energy outside of ourselves. So when we are in the presence of others, we are emitting our heart energy into their space and they're emitting their heart energy into ours. So without saying a word, we are always saying something. 
and as it is our intent that is more powerful than the words we say. So knowing that when we enter a space with children and young people and we have pure intent in our heart, um, it's really hard to make an error uh, because our children and young people and just anyone in general know that we're there for the right reasons. So that's scientific fact, everyone, and I'll leave you with that. Please enjoy your evening. Thank you for this amazing opportunity. I really appreciate you, Nat, um, and, and bringing me in. This has been awesome. And Kira Lee, you're such a brain of knowledge and I just want to squeeze your brain juice one day and I think if you're available for a cappuccino or two, I'm happy to catch up. I think that would be awesome. Absolutely. Thank you.